Good evening, everyone. Here, Imran Abbas. Again, we are live. I am live from Dubai. And today, we have Professor Kazama Zakanuri. As you know, he is a well-known bariatric surgeon at the Globe. He is a leading bariatric surgeon. And he has a huge experience in metabolic surgery in low BMI met, uh, diabetic patients. As my uh, viewers, you know, uh, I have started this series with Professor Alper Chilek, and he mentioned his in interview, Professor uh, Kazama is a mentor of Alper Chilek, and he learned this metabolic surgery in low BMI diabetic patient in Japan. And really, it was interesting for me. So I will now take the time. Sir, please, over to you. Thank you. So it's really honor that uh, Dr. Arpa Celik said uh, I, I was his mentor. And actually, uh, I'm his friend. And he came to Japan, and then he first touched with uh, bariatric and metabolic surgery in my hospital. Then he was fascinated with the results of diabetes remission after metabolic surgery. So uh, he went back to his hometown and then uh, he started the practice of metabolic surgery. And now he's one of the pioneer of metabolic surgery in the world. I'm very proud of him. Sir, so much thanks. And sir, really, we also all proud of you. There is no doubt because if mentor yeah, like you, then the product will be like Alper Chilek. Uh, sir, we have in this session uh, that our main target is metabolic surgery in low BMI diabetic patient. We have so divided this session in three parts. First, we will talk about your brief introduction and also patient selection. In second part, we will talk about technical points that is a specific type of surgery that you prefer, especially in low BMI diabetic patients. And third one, we will talk about the results and follow up your patients. Sir, please, your brief introduction and your journey of metabolic surgery. Thank you. Uh, my, name, my name is Kazunori Kasama. I'm doing a practice in Tokyo, Japan, Yotsuya Medical Cube. And I was uh, the president. I'm now the, the immediate past president of IFSO APC and also the past president of APMBSS, Asian Pacific Bariatric Metabolic Surgery Society. And also I'm the chair of International Committee of Japan Society of Endoscopic Surgery, which has the one of the biggest endoscopic society in the world. And my journey of metabolic surgery started when I started bariatric surgery. Because my mentor of bariatric surgery is uh, Dr. Ricardo Cohen in Brazil. As you know that he first started the metabolic surgery for uh, normal BMI patients for the the, as a diabetes treatment with the full stomach preserving duodenal jejunal bypass. And uh, at first time, the, his result was quite nice, but in a long time, that the result of uh, stomach preserving duodenal jejunal bypass was not that good. But uh, he proved that the, well, the the remission of diabetes is independently independent from weight loss at that time. Yeah, I think it's uh, one of the the earliest time of the metabolic surgery, which discovered the independent mechanism of the weight loss. And then, uh, Ricardo Cohen introduced me to Francisco Lubino. It was 2007, and uh, I was so fascinated by his idea of metabolic surgery. 
so that uh, my journey started from that point. One is by Ricardo Cohen, and the second one was uh, uh, Francesco Rubino. So and also that uh, I'm in Tokyo, so that uh, I was one of the member of Asian Pacific Society of Bariatric Surgery, and which was led by Professor Wei Jie Li. Wei Jie Li is also a pioneer of the metabolic surgery in Asia, and he published a huge number of papers in Asian diabetes. So that, so that's three guys, uh, my mentor and the friends to let my journey started. Sir, so much thanks, really. And now, so we can know, we can, I can ask. So uh, you involved uh, with, with the metabolic surgery about two decades. So definite today, tonight, it will be great uh, debate. And uh, we all know the role of uh, Professor Rubinio when, and also along with the Professor Michel Ghanie, when they uh, also start this theory that foregut and hindgut theory and role of this uh, <clears throat> hormonal, especially small bowel as a large uh, endocrine and the role of GLP-1 and how when we bypass this uh, upper GI and also when undigested food material touch to terminal ileum and L cell and rise of GLP-1 and then impact of GLP-1 on beta cell and hypertrophy and everything uh, and also many, many things. Uh, sir, just because one of the things that is the most important in my opinion is patient selection, especially when BMI is low. Okay, we, we all know when in morbid obese, we do bariatric surgery and also this metabolic syndrome will be solved, resolved, definite. But what is your criteria? to select a low BMI patient with diabetes, you check any lab test, what is more important for you? So that's a quite nice question. So that uh, I don't do the metabolic surgery for normal BMI patient. I do a metabolic surgery for the BMI above 27.5 for a long time. And my so that uh, from BMI 27.5 to 35, uh, I prefer to do a bypass surgery for uh, the treatment of diabetes. And uh, also, I think that the important thing is the beta cell function. But one of the important things for the uh, selection of patient is that um, uh, C-peptide is more than one. So if C peptide is less than one, it's very hard to get the remission of type 2 diabetes. And uh, for such kind of patients, sometimes surgery do harm. And also that we select the patient for the, the younger patient. I mean, the BA, uh, age over 65 is not an indication for metabolic surgery to us. So because uh, such kind of patient has a very low function or beta cell or the pancreas. So for, you know, that the elderly patient is very hard to get a uh, remission of type 2 diabetes because they have the very long term of diabetes, long history of diabetes. So it's really hard to uh, have an improvement of a remission of type 2 diabetes. So that for the lab test, we did, of course, we do a usual the test for bariatric surgery, and also we do some um, uh, C peptide level and check ABCD score. So ABCD score is a, the prediction score, which Professor Wei Jie Li invented from the Asian database, and uh, if they the score is high, the three gastrectomy alone can work very well. But if the score is very low, uh, we select the patient for diabetes. But if the score is 0.0 or 0.1, it's a very, very low score, 
it's very hard to get the remission even after metabolic surgery. So we use ABC, modified ABCD score to select the patients and also to select the procedures. Sir, we are interested to know more about uh, this uh, calculator because as I know about Cleveland Clinic, uh, uh, the, the calculator and also they mention, uh, so if score will be like this because if their patient is suffering with CHF, patient is suffering with, so has a previous or past history of DVT and male patient age and different things they mention, if this score will be high, because overall surgery is risky in such a situation, we prefer a sleeve gastrectomy that is the shortest and there is less chance of a surgical complication in such a situation because there is more chance of uh, DVT or thrombosis after surgery due to this, we prefer such a sleeve gastrectomy. But we are interested about uh, to hear more about this ABCD calculator if possible, please, sir, share any, if you have any PowerPoint or any presentation, we will appreciate you, sir. Okay, let me check that. Because it is interesting. I never hear about this. Uh, about oh, really? CD. Yeah, I, I never hear. So I show you the my presentation. I will share my screen. Sure, sir. You can share. Can you see this one? My yeah, screen? Yes, sir. We can see. So this is the modified ABCD score. The ABCD score was uh, invented by Professor Wei Jie Li and uh, in combination with uh, the data from Japan, Korea, India, and also Taiwan and Hong Kong to the March Center database in Asia. So this is a data for Asian uh, metabolic surgery. And the ABCD score, A means age. If the patient is older than 40, we scored zero point. And the B is the body mass index. If the lower BMI, like a BMI less than 27, we scored zero point. And, uh, and if the, the BMI over 42, we score three point. And the uh, serum C peptide level, if the C peptide is less than two, we score zero point. And then more than five, we score three point. And the duration of diabetes, if they're longer than eight, the score is zero. And the less than one year, score three. And um, so lower the score means very severe diabetes. It's hard to get the remission. And the higher the score, it's a very mild diabetes. It is easy to get the remission after surgery. So this is the data from Asian data. And uh, we compared the, the, the score of IMS score and also modified ABC score and the DILM score. For our Asian patient, so that's our data and the wages data, it's a, that it's a different data group, but also the results was the same. Our Asian data, the modified ABCD score is uh, a little bit more accurate than IMS score or DILM score, which was invented by Western uh, surgeons using a Western patient data. So sometimes uh, diabetes in Asian diabetes is a little bit different from uh, Western diabetes because it the uh, uh, insulin level is uh, quite low in Asian patients. Also, BMI is uh, quite low in uh, Asian diabetes patients. So that's for us. So modified ABCD score. This ABCD score is uh, a bit accurate 
than other prediction scores. In Sir, I have, I have one question in this uh, in this because uh, this interview the main uh, target is to discuss if uh, we have any question. So if we see this age, so when age is less than forty, so just imagine that it will be thirty twenty five. There is more chance of type one and also uh, immune impact uh, that will be more. So you 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 can mention twenty five to forty. 30 to 40, or there is no limit in low because when we see in child, so the, there is type 1 diabetes. So this is just my, my query. Of course, we, ha we have to exclude type 1 diabetes and also the autoimmune diseases like ALADA. Yeah. To check uh, some, uh, I forgot that. Yeah. Autoimmune impact, we must rule out that. That's right. So we have to check before surgery. We are talking about type 2 diabetes. Yeah. And also in Asia, our problem of type 2 diabetes is a young onset type 2 diabetes. Yeah. So in yes. Asian country, the 20% of all type 2 diabetes is young onset type 2 diabetes, which means the, the type 2 diabetes occurs less than 40 years old. Yeah. Okay, sir. And then, okay. yeah. And then for the the young type types of diabetes patient, the problem is that uh, such kind of patient easily developed uh, end organ failure, like uh, linear failure or brightness in the very high percentages. And also the problem in the Asian country is a diabetic patient die young, like uh, you know the age of 40 and 50. So it's a bit different from the Western country. Yes. We have to show some data. Let me let me see some data. Okay. okay. Yeah, excellent. Excellent, sir. This was amazing. So this A B C D definitely it will be effective. And also for yeah, A B C D was very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, let me check some fries. Because on the base of this A, B, C, D, we can predict the results. And also we yes. can select the uh, patient because patient selection is more important. Because if, we, if you will do, especially when patient is low BMI, BMI 27, 27.5. So that is not uh, morbid obese, that is a class one, especially in our area, in this region. So according to the definition, uh, so then if we will go for surgery and uh, we must rule out uh, such, uh, especially LADA, autoimmune impact. Sir, you routinely you rule out, uh, you check GAD and also islet cell antibody in low BMI. This is your routine practice? Yes, that's my, that's our routine. We have to check that. Okay, let me see some data from Asia. So in Asia, we have many diabetes patients. 60% of diabetes patients in in the world is oh my God. in Asia. Okay? Yes. And also that uh, mean BMI among type 2 diabetes patients is uh, quite different from Western country. So that the, our majority of diabetes patients is a lower BMI patient. Yes. As I told you that the problem of the Asian diabetes is a uh, young onset diabetes. It's a diagnosis younger than 40 years old. And the 20% of diabetes patients in Asia is a young onset diabetes. It's quite different from Western country. In United States, it was less than 10%. And the problem of young onset diabetes is uh, one in third young onset diabetes had died or suffered a major event by the age of 60 in Asia. And as a matter of fact, you can see that this is Asian data. It's a quite different from Western country. So this is a number of 
death from the diabetes. So in Asia, diabetic patients die young in comparison with the Western country. And also our problem is a gastric cancer. And 70% of gastric cancer are from Asia and the more than 50% worldwide are from Japan, Korea, and China. So that we, our concern is also the young onset diabetes and gastric cancer when we treat uh, patients by uh, metabolic surgery. So that not the usual gastric bypass is uh, not very highly recommended in this kind of uh, countries. So that we have to think the metabolic surgery by Asian surgeons for Asian patients with Asian evidence. So I always focus the Asian evidence to treat uh, Asian uh, diabetes patient. So that's the reason we use uh, ABCD score. ABCD score are from Asian data. And uh, more precise for the, the as a prediction of an Asian diabetic patient after surgery. This is a, a little bit different from Western country. And this is quite an interesting point in Asian metabolic surgery. Sir, excellent. So, excellent. Yeah, please, sir. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, please. So, sir, this because as you have mentioned, so in, in your slides and in your presentation, if we see, so definite in Asian people, there is low BMI till you have mentioned in China, as I, I, I remember, so that was BMI 24, that was the uh, right. mean, yeah, a low because central obesity is the dominant. And with the passage of time, we can see so uh, maybe in future there will be a new criteria because you people you are the your role is leading especially you are someone who are uh, also also introduced these guidelines maybe in future we will not talk about bmi only waste will be more important for us so if we see mm. the this uh, uh, waste hip ratio maybe in future that will be one of the criteria for selection of uh, this uh, metabolic surgery in low BMI. Sir, what is your opinion, especially about the waist? Because if waist is 100, 110 centimeter, just imagine, so the patient is central obese, but BMI is 23, 24. So, and also diabetic patient, just imagine age is 40, 45, young patient. So can we go a surgery for such a patient? Yeah, that's a very nice question. That the one of my friends in India said that uh, this waist and the hip ratio will be uh, uh, the indication of metabolic surgery. I agree with that. So that uh, we are collecting data, but uh, still we don't have uh, uh, enough data to make it into a guideline of uh, surgery. But I think it have a possibility to, to be a, the indication of surgery in near future. Definitely. Sir, now because we talk about uh, already about patient selection and especially this A, B, C, D, a calculator that was amazing and definitely hopefully uh, for my viewers for myself especially in future for selection of patient it will be very helpful now we i am interested to know more about technical points in this low bmi because as you have mentioned uh, so 27.5 is your the lowest line uh, especially for metabolic surgery and then above if the patients 27.5 till 35 so that is about class one obesity. So what you prefer, which type of surgery for these patient routinely you prefer and what is the technical points? We are interested to know more about this. Yes, uh, my preference of surgery is uh, sleep DJB. Maybe your alpha 
and metabolic surgery in my hospital was uh, 3DJB. He was uh, more, uh, uh, so we talk about ileal interposition and also about bipartition. So that was uh, his talk. And, but uh, he, as he mentioned, he asked, so uh, meta this ileal interposition is king of metabolic surgery. So as he mentioned, but so I am interesting about that technique. That is the loop uh, duodeno jejunostomy sleep plus surgery that you have mentioned. Now, as I understand, there is a sleep. Then will be a loop. Uh, this duodeno jejunostomy. Am yeah. I correct, sir? Yes, that's true. So I I'll show some slides. Can I share my screen? Uh, sure, sir. Sure, sir. <clears throat> Because already I have interviewed Professor C.K. Huang. Mm. Yeah, C.K. also, he is also a follower of this uh, sleep plus DJB. Yeah, so that, uh, of course, uh, C.K. Huang is uh, one of my best friends. And uh, we developed the metabolic surgery in Asia. And uh, first, the three plus procedure that I did was 2007. It was a combination of a gastric bypass and street gastrectomy. As I told you that one of the problem in Japan is a gastric cancer. So yes. that uh, it's a uh, really risky to make a uh, uh, bypass to stomach, which is impossible to check Remnant. by end of Yeah. So that, but bypass surgery, is uh, more effective than strip gastric alone in terms of uh, remission of type 2 diabetes. Then I did a combination of strip gastric me and gastric bypass as a strip duodenal jejunal bypass. This is a schema of the strip DJB. It's very easy to understand. It's um, it's uh, like a mimicking uh BPDDS. But the smaller gastric tube, just like a usual sleep gastric me, and also the longer common channel. Because of the Asian particularity, they we take less protein intake per day in comparison with Western patients. So it's, it's in Asia, the Asian patient just took, just take uh, half or less than half of uh, protein than the American patient. So that too much hyperabsorptive procedure like a BPDDS uh, or SADI is uh, sometimes very risky to make uh, malnutrition for Asian patients. As you know that we Asian have many the vegetarians and uh, the less protein intake patient. So that the Shrimp DJB is uh, the long common channel PPDDS and the similar uh, streamer gastric tube, so like a uh, Asian BPDDS. And uh, the Shrimp DJB, is, uh, we have a loop DJB, which was invented by uh, we, uh, Shike Huang. It's a same concept with uh, DJB for Asian and uh, like an Asian study. So I'll show some technique. Can I see your videos? Yeah, I can see, sir, please. Okay. So one of the points of the DJB is a duodenum dissection. Yeah, because this is the most so, important. Just I back from USA, I was there in ASMBS annual meeting in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And as you know, so Americans, they are, they are doing this DS and Saudi. Mm -hmm. And the talk, so the main talk was so this duodenal dissection, how they must dissect 
that is the main part because as you know here the the dissection is of the duodenum from the the greater curvature is not that very difficult so just make a hole on the top of the duodenum and then push yes uh paper yes because there very... is a gastro duodenal artery here just and be careful to this for our youngsters because when they are going to expose this area yes so as i was a gastric cancer surgeon so that it's quite uh not I, that I, difficult to us and uh, this is one of the important points not to injure the duodenum at the time of the dissection. Yes. And the count the length of uh, check the trice ligament. It's a, it's the same with the usual the gastric bypass. But the important thing is, is we need to count the BP limb. So the count the length of BP limb, I usually put the 200 centimeter of the BP limb and then make a hole and uh, divide. As you know, the CK that loop DJB, yes. loop is easier because it doesn't have to do this kind of things. But I started Lu and Y fashion, so I still do a Lu and Y. DJB for the low BMI patient, but I prefer to do a loop for the very severe uh, morbid obesity patient like a BMI over 60. And the counter length of alimentary tract, it's uh, almost 100 centimeters. And then make a jejun jejun sumi. And the technique of jejun jejun stomy is uh, quite same with the gastric bypass, but we usually use uh, 60 millimeter the stapler to make a jejun jejun stomy so that it's a little bit longer than the usual gastric bypass. And then closer the mesentery and uh, closer entry four by uh, hand suturing technique. It's a quite the same with uh, usual gastric bypass. And of course, we cause a mesentic defect. And the, the important thing is uh, duodenal jejunostomy. I do a uh, hand sewing um, two layer anastomosis. So she could prefer one layer, but I prefer two layer for secure. And uh, including uh, the staple line of duodenum, I suture the, the muscular layers and then make a hole on uh, 2.5 centimeter of the anastomosis size. Then prefer to do a uh, unsuturing anastomosis. The one of the advantage of hand suturing anastomosis is uh, we don't need a very long uh, duodenum. So we just cut uh, less than one centimeter from pyrrhic ring. So it's quite easy to make anastomosis with hand suturing technique. So in comparison with my uh, Lumea gastric bypass, this duodenal jejunostomy is much less uh, stenosis and much less ulceration in comparison with uh, gastro jejunostomy of gastric bypass. One of the reasons is that the less tension at anastomosis than 
Lumen Gastric Bypass. Yeah. So to tell the truth, the no leakage by my hand and also no stenosis in my series. So it's quite less than um, gastric bypass. And I do a leak test by endoscope. Of course, there's no leakage by air. So this is my technique of DJB. Of course, I also do the same technique for the loop DJB, the two layer hand suturing anastomosis for loop fashion. So excellent, excellent. And also because we have a lot of question also personally, I have a lot of question about this technique. And then we will sure. talk about uh, results. Uh, I have just idea. This is my idea maybe uh, because you can go ahead, especially in low BMI because already you are doing uh, also this duodeno jejunostomy. That is the loop duodeno jejunostomy in low BMI. Yeah. But you are stapling this D1, okay? Now, as you know, we have started SASI, and personally, I am doing SASI, and hundreds of patients I did SASI for diabetic patient, especially in low BMI. And personally, also, I am doing stepless SASI. What means stepless SASI? I plicate stomach, and also mm -hmm. that entro jejunostomy that is also hand so in no use of stapler and that is cost effective especially mm -hmm. in, in our countries in pakistan and also if people they cannot pay for staplers okay only the benefit of staplers uh, is cost effectiveness i must highlight but overall when you do with stapler much easier that will be uh, so uh, uh, effective no doubt there is no difference but just what i what i want to highlight I understand, yes, when we will do duodeno jejunostomy, there is less chance of marginal ulcer because the mucosa of uh, small bowel, both sides, definite. If we compare with SASI, with uh, any type of gastro jejunostomy or gastro ileostomy, there is more chance of marginal, no doubt. So what is my, what is my idea? Maybe you can go ahead and in future we will see such a surgery you can do loop duodenostomy without stapling D1. Patient low mm. BMI. Patient is low BMI. Okay, just patient is 25. Because when we will see central obesity and we will come down, so maybe we will come down. When we will see the mean BMI of our type 2 diabetic patients is 24 we must mm -hmm. think for these people. So when we will go down, so we cannot bypass so small bowel, then there will be more chance of so weight loss. But when we attach this loop to duodenum without stapling of duodenum, our main target will be hormonal impact. Just some part of undigested nutrient will go to uh, this terminal ileum and rise of GLP-1 and many things that you know better than me. What is your idea about this? I think that makes sense. But of course, still uh, experimental procedures for such kind of procedures. But uh, yeah, of course, we have to think of the procedure according to their situation, like a BMI and also the economic situation and the uh, also, the how much the fat inside the, the abdomen. So we need to think of the procedures according to the patient situation, and so that that what you said was, uh, I think it makes sense. So but it's, still, it's an experimental procedure, so that we have to we have to gather some data. Yeah, definitely. No, because your point here. And you can lead such a surgeries because uh, so when when uh, so Kazama will start such a surgery definite so people will hear about this and that it makes sense you will follow your patients and the results then maybe because now routinely that's a SASI is the routine surgery now especially in Middle East where I am sitting in Dubai so this is the common surgery now 
and especially our uh, in other countries as well. So for low BMI diabetic patient, very effective. Also, you have access to Duodena with the endoscope. So another my question that that is my concern in 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 your surgery, especially when we staple D1, then access to uh, CBD. So if there is a CBD mm -hmm. stone, so what you will do? Have you any experience? So it's a it's a quite difficult to access CBD by endoscope after this surgery because the BP limb is very long. So that the, from a viewpoint of accessing CBD stone, uh, accessing CBD, sashimi makes sense. So due to this, sir, because when we think when because you are leading person, uh, so definite when you will decide. And uh, also in uh, such a person like you, so your leaders, especially in metabolic surgery, and this will be first. Just imagine a patient in age 30, 35, 40, and we did this surgery, DJ bait. And then, so we have no access to duodenum. We have no access to that D2. We have no access to that part of uh, body. Mm, I have no idea. Yes, so we cannot remove prophylactic lab coli. Also, not make sense. We cannot do uh, prophylactic sphincterotomy. So for the patients that maybe in future there will be the CBD stone and like like these things. Uh, so so overall, so because now many years you are doing this surgery, have you experienced any patient any CBD stone? Uh. I have no experience of CBD stone after this kind of surgery. But if a uh, CBD stone happened, we check uh, MRCP and whether there, this is a CBD stone or not. And then if CBD stone happens and the symptomatic, we do our uh, lab CBD stone surgery. Laparoscopic yeah. surgery for yeah, yeah. CBD stone. Then explore, yes, CBD and explore CBD and so that will be Lyca, and then you can coldoscopy, and also you can remove the stones, definite, but endoscopically, so it will be a definite difficult. But when you will do this loop, duodenal jejunostomy, that loop without stapling D1, so then also you have the access to that part, and also in your area, because this gastric cancer is so common, so yes. You have, uh, you can do endoscopy also to control your patients and as well as access to duodenum, especially in low BMI diabetic patients. Yeah, of course, that uh, this is a balance between risk and the benefit. So we still don't have uh, any SASI uh, patient in our country. No other surgeon also don't do SASI so that. Uh, we don't. We still don't have uh, many data from Asian patients. So the we waiting for year data in the long term after SASI. So if SASI is superior to DJB, uh, we need to change our idea to SASI. Yeah. So of course that uh, we do our practice on evidence basis, so that uh, we are waiting for the the long-term data of SASI from other countries, especially from Asian Pacific region. Definitely, sir. Sir, about so this when uh, one of the main concern because now in USA, the main debate, because just now they accept OAGB from ASMBS and they were talking mm -hmm. about this Bill Roth too and also um, maybe this gastro jejunostomy, especially in when this is the loop and bile will come there and there is more chance of malignancy. So what is your opinion? Have you any opinion about this? So this is not related to uh, our topic overall. If we do OAGB or any type of uh, this loop gastro jejunostomy like SASI, SASI is also bile will come there and there is this because, uh, so, so what is your opinion? So as I experienced, of gastric cancer surgeon, yeah, we in Japan now don't do uh, below two anastomosis. 
because the viral exposure to stomach is one of the risk factor of the laminate gastric cancer in the long term. Our data from National Cancer Center, it happened more than 30 years after the uh, below two procedures from the benign gastrectomy. So that uh, my concern for the one anastomosis gastric bypass, also SASI, is the exposure, the viral exposure to the stomach. May, maybe uh, there is a possibility to cause uh, gastric cancer at the anastomosis site. Sir, because uh, because this is very important because now nowadays so this OAGB is good. Personally, I am also my main practice is also OAGB and I am doing uh, routinely OAGB, and this is very important because according to your data, because just two weeks ago I was also in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, and one of our colleague from Brazil, Professor Carlos, he was there, and also he mentioned your data, Japanese data. And that mm -hmm. was after 30 years, he mentioned, so also this partial gastrectomy was for benign reason. Because I remember when I was resident of surgery, so about 20, 25 years ago, I remember at that time, our one of our practice was partial gastrectomy due to this peptic ulcer disease, because at that time there was no PPI. So after PPI, mm -hmm. yes, now we are not doing at that time. I remember we were doing this... Uh, uh, vagotomy and also highly selective vagotomy, partial gastrectomy, bill row two. That was on daily basis. Two, three, two, three cases we were doing <laughs> at that time. Yeah. Yes. If you yeah, you are definitely you are also doing such a cases. So my question, yes. my question, because I want to confirm this, uh, that that data, Japanese data, they mention after 30 years and also following their bill row two, all of these cases were benign, there was no malignant case in, in these cases because sometimes when we do partial gastrectomy for gastric cancer as well, all of these cases were, that was under so your study, were only this partial gastrectomy due to benign reasons? Yes, so the, probably the data from our National Cancer Center was only from the first surgery was a benign cases. Okay. You you see the, the Carlos from Brazil with the Carlos Shivai? I mean Yeah, yeah, Carlos Shivai. He was there. Yeah, he's he's my good friend. He yeah. he was working with uh Hikaru Cohen and uh, when I went to Brazil, yeah, he was there and he was a very good friend of mine too. <laughs> Excellent. He was nice, nice person, and also he demonstrated live surgery. Uh, Rowan Y gastric bypass as well there and also uh, so uh, present different presentation and one of thing because at that time also I talked with him about this because this is very important and maybe maybe Japanese overall you are prone to gastric cancer we have no we cannot confirm this was due to bile exposure because routinely we do uh, endoscopy so there is uh, bile in stomach so bile in stomach itself is not, uh, I think, uh, uh, only carcinogenic. But uh, I have no idea when, when we do this gastro jejunostomy or gastroiliastomy, and that cancer, that gastric carcinoma in those cases, in your study, in, I don't know, was only reason of bile, because routinely also bile is in stomach. It depends on patients that uh, usually we pre um the pyrrhic queen can preserve the bile in stomach, and some patients develop the bile in stomach in before surgery. But uh, as a matter of fact, after B two reconstruction or one osmosis reconstruction, bile directly goes to a stomach, and uh, we think that is one of the reason of the carcinoma in the long term, 30, 40 years after surgery. It's not the 10 years, not the 20 years. Our result is 30 years. 
the average, as far as I know that the average, the duration after the previous surgery to the, the carcinoma, second carcinoma is a 34 years. And sir, first my, my just because this is very important and now the, your data and your that research is a as a reference at the bottom. And many surgeons they are referring. So maybe those patients had family history of gastric carcinoma. Uh, so that the patient, so because overall in Japan, as you have mentioned earlier, so uh, the gastric carcinoma is common as compared to other world. So maybe those mm -hmm. patients had also family history of gastric carcinoma. But he also mentioned in that presentation. So this gastric carcinoma was the, the part of this gastrogenostomy. So this was little concerning. So it was not other parts of the stomach. When they did this below two, only that part. So that was the gastric carcinoma. So another thing if we see now one anastomosis gastric bypass or MGB, you know, more than two decades. So we are practicing and thousands of cases, and, but nothing. So still, thanks God, no case of uh, malignancy and hope after three decades, after 30 years, will be same. But if it is effective and this bile direct contact of bile with the gastric mucosa, that is the permanent contact. Because always this is the loop 24 hour. I agree with you. Routinely, yes, bile is there. Bile is there. But here also pancreatic juice is also there. So if we see the loop, so this is not only bile. That is when we do one anastomosis gastric bypass, this is not only bile. Also pancreatic juice is with the bile. This mixture of bile with pancreatic juice and direct and permanent contact with the gastric mucosa, hope there will be no issue. I have no idea. So, as I said, that it's uh, the duration is more than 30 years so that we are, uh, we need to, I think uh, I need to wait and see. Yeah. So, <laughs> of course, I just say that there is a possibility. I don't deny the result of uh, one osmosis gastric bypass, and it's a quite nice result from Rutrich and other surgeons like uh, Wei Jie Li and the other surgeons. And uh, but from the the viewpoint of ex gastric cancer surgeon, I think in Japan we have to wait and see. I agree with you, sir. Sir, we have a question from our viewers. So already you have shown showed your uh, this video and closing up in DJB when you are doing Ru and Y. So their question is a live question from our viewers. Uh, when you do loop this duodenal jejunostomy at that time, also you close your Peterson or no? Then there is no need to close. I I close Peterson space for the loop DJB. Also, you close. Of course, the CK cross, but the way it doesn't cross. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's a preference of surgeon. Yeah, because but, in uh, OAGB we never close our this defect now. But have we have personally? I never see this uh, internal hernia. But uh, yes, some some surgeons already so they publish their data and there is less chance because this defect is uh, so big defect and also wider defect. Yeah. And maybe this telescopic movement of small bowel is there, but there is less chance of incarceration and strangulation of small bowel. But patient maybe will have long time vague pain, vague abdominal pain. That is maybe due to that telescopic movement of small bowel in this defect. Uh, sir, now, now more than about two decades. So Professor Kazama is practicing this metabolic. What is your main concern? Now in 2022, after doing this DJ Bay, what is your main concern? Okay, my concern after DJ Bay in a long time is, uh, of course, like other surgery, malnutrition Still in a long time. Yes. So the sometime 
patients are very fine and uh, don't want to be followed up in the long term. Usually, I followed up for patients more than five years, and then I ask them to come uh, once a year. But uh, of course, uh, 10 years after surgery, they don't frequently come. So for the, the patient who had surgery 15 years ago, it's very rare to come to follow up. But as far as I know, they haven't called me. So probably they are fine, but still we don't have uh, any uh, reliable data in the long term, like uh, 15 years. 10 years is okay. I have a few patients for the 10 years follow up, but the 15 years, not that good. Very, very rare to come. Yes. And also the, the another problem after metabolic surgery is a relapse of diabetes. Yeah, yeah. This was my next question. Yes. So I show some long-term results. So which percentage of your patient relapsed diabetes? And this was my definite next question. Yes. This is my data of the remission of type 2 diabetes after five years. So relapse rate from one year is 10%. But uh, as you can see here, five years, still the non-medication patient is a lot. But the relapse means uh, BMI, uh, hemoglobin MRC, up to more than 5.6% with medication or without medication. So the still five year result is good, but uh, from the, the definition of ADA, the relapse rate is 10%. Not that bad, but even after such kind of uh, very strong metabolic surgery, some patients may have relapsed, so that we have to follow up that patient. Yes. And also the, the definite sir, definite. So this is the, uh, so we must know about this and we must talk with our patient before surgery. You are diabetic patient. You will be diabetic patients. And also some of our patients, what they think. So when I will do surgery, okay, finish. Then there are no diabetes. No, no, you are diabetic patient. Okay, you must be careful, especially carbs and all that uh, dietary. So a healthy lifestyle is the uh, main. So you are, uh, what I talk with the patient, you are diabetic patient after surgery without medicine, but still you are diabetic patient. Be careful because if you will not care, so definite, they, we have less uh, beta cell reservoir. There is more chance of relapse of diabetes. Yes, that's right. I I thought, I always thought my patient that we uh, reset the situation. But you have a you still have a tendency to be diabetic. So that if you can do a very healthy lifestyle, you can maintain very healthy the situation. But uh, if you choose the lifestyle to be diabetic, you'll be a chance to be a diabetic again. Yeah, definitely. And then this, this is the more important. Sir, really so much thanks. And really it was, in my opinion, one of the best session because now I am talking with someone who has experience of this metabolic surgery in low BMI more than two decades. Sir, any message for our youngsters who are just now going to start metabolic surgery? Yes. I, uh, the metabolic surgery is a not magic barrett 
we need to have a very careful selection of the patient. So when we do a surgery, we have to choose a patient who can have a remission or improvement of diabetes after surgery. So we have to exclude the patient who cannot get uh, improvement after surgery. So that may, uh, surgery may cause some harm to our patient. So that patient selection is very important for metabolic surgery. And also that the data is very important. I would like to tell that the young surgeon to correct the real data and the publish your data. So important thing is the data correction and the make evidence. Yeah. Sir, so much thanks. Really, you are always supportive, always, anytime. And so I see, uh, and uh, your role is really still leading role in bariatric and metabolic surgery. We need your support. And uh, so much thanks, always, your cooperation with global laparoscopy and robotics. Now, thanks, God. So there is no limitation of uh, COVID 19, and we can move easily. And we will prefer in near future under your supervision, we must have some master classes, especially for our youngsters. Sir, again, so much thanks for your support and really appreciable, sir. Over my pleasure. Thank you. So much thanks and thank you, my viewers, always your support. And this these sessions are due to your support. And next week, Tuesday at 10 p.m., Dubai time, 10 p.m., uh, so we will be live with another expert of metabolic surgery in low BMI. We will continue this series till December. And in Jan 2023, we will have a sum up session. So my thanks for your support. And if you have any question from professor, you can ask in uh, comments and definitely professor will answer. Sir, so much thanks and have a nice time. Thank you. Have Thank a good you, day. Sir. Have a good night. Thank you, sir.